Uh, my name is Dan, Dan Clarizio. I uh, manage the uh, UI team at Red Hat for the CFM product and the Manage IT project. Uh, the title on the on the agenda, I think, is called UI Directions and Roadmap. But more, it's more like directions because we're just kind of right now going like this. We don't really know exactly the road we're taking. So we, we're going to try to give you an um, idea of, of the things that we can work on as well as the things that we are already starting to work on and hopefully uh, get some ideas from everyone here as well as what you'd like to see this work on. So um, we're hoping to um, like open up some more information to the community so that uh, we can get some help. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can make recipes for and things where people just want to contribute a little bit to be able to help us out in certain ways. And then there's other big projects that we have going on. And who knows, maybe uh, someone will take over one of them. All right, there's a lot of areas that uh, we need to cover. Uh, we've been heads down uh, for the first part of the year doing uh, open sourcing the product, which took a lot of work because when we were uh, proprietary, we had a lot of libraries that just did the best thing. You know, we, we weren't uh, opposed to using open source, but a lot of times open source couldn't fill the role that we needed to get some of the functionality into the UI, so we went another way. So, of course, uh, during open sourcing, we Got rid of a lot of that, um, but there's still some in there that uh, it's not proprietary, but it's probably not the best solution because it's kind of restrictive. You know, we took the best, the path of least resistance, I would say, with the limited number of resources we had at the time. And uh, now that we have uh, better resources and uh, we want to try to follow the open source path a little bit, we can open up our, our eyes to different things. So there's uh, product features which are always in demand. I mean, there's probably a, a huge list of product features. I just saw all new ones popping out in all these other presentations for the, for the user interface to take, take in. Um, there's new technologies, which we'll talk about. Um, some integrations, uh, we need to, I think Oleg mentioned it before, we need to open up our product a little bit, make it a little easier for um, other people to add, add uh, functionality and screens and things to our, to our product. There's also a lot of uh, refactoring and rewrites. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail on that later. Um, but uh, because of the way we've kind of blasted through and added features, taking some shortcuts. And so <laughs> we need to uh, um, change the way that some of the code is put together, in addition to getting some of the integrations in, it's going to help, help doing it that way. And then I'll just cover a little bit about the JavaScript controls that we're using and we plan on using. Um, I brought with me some, uh, I call them subject matter, matter experts. <laughs> so I've got Martin and Eric and Eric, and they're going to take over parts of the presentation to explain them a little more in depth, sometimes very in depth. And then, uh, Promise to end on some nice colorful screens because I know we've all been watching a lot of bullets, so we'll end on that. All right, so product features that we're currently working on. Um, we're about halfway through some of the uh, automate enhancement lists that we've done. Uh, we added the domain support that uh, Greg's group put in the back end, along with all the copying and cloning and you know just everything that takes to, to kind of show those differences in the, in the automate database. There's a storage UI which uh, hasn't gotten a lot of love lately. Um, it was kind of hidden, so it actually still is hidden behind a, uh, a secret setting you put into your uh, template file, and uh, it's gonna be opened up. It's currently NetApp only, but there, are, there is some work um, uh, behind that to add another storage provider and probably others in the future. So we went back, even though it was not turned on, we went back and cleaned it all, make sure it's all functioning and everything, so that's ready to be turned on. And then internationalization support, which we're currently working on, and Martin's going to talk a little bit more in depth about that. So again, inside Automate, these are the things that we've kind of done. Um, we're working on some of these. Um, and obviously, as Automate gets more and more, uh, more features, we have to kind of follow along. Um, talking about taking Automate out of the database, so what's that going to affect? You know, do we need to be able to import, export, and stuff differently, differently, and things like that? So there's going to be some definite uh, work done in the UI on that. On the storage UI, I mentioned this, but here's some of the other types that we'll probably be covering in the future: EMC, Hitachi is here, HP maybe. You know, we don't know. Um, depends which uh, which ones get the most push. Right? Um, Speaking to Rich about this, I mean, there's, there's going to be some redesign because there, there's a lot of overlapping concepts, but then you get to certain storage types and, and then, you know, we've got specific uh, implementation, specific, specific types of things that we have to show and relationships even. You know, so they don't all map again. Of course, that's how sort of our life, right? That's what makes our, our whole uh, project uh, so complicated. In the new technologies area, inside the UI, 
Um, what we're doing is trying to get up to speed on some of the, the I know not latest, but the newer, you know, the more accepted technologies like Haml and SAS. Um, we've kind of followed what uh, Red Hat's doing uh, across products and along with pattern fly stuff uh, to uh, get more consistent uh, types of views and things, as well as uh, having a more responsive design. Eric's going to cover that. Eric and I are going to cover that. Um, we're starting to play with Angular. Um, we've really, we took uh, the Rails RJS remote JavaScript stuff, kind of hook, line, and sinker, and bit on it, and then we probably uh, used it, abused it like crazy. Um, but uh, I, I think that's uh, kind of going away, so we want to get to something that will uh, uh, not only be easier to, to work with, but um, also allow us to not be um, so dependent on that, and not, not have so many transactions flying. We have a lot of transactions flying. So. Um, also, um, we're trying to get away from our custom-made VNC plugin. Uh, I think Jason built that for us, um, and get into something more generic like no VNC. And so we're working, actually working on that right now. As far as integrations, um, we are just now starting to look at it. Like I said, we've been heads down on this, and also trying to get out the latest release of the product. And so we're just now starting to look at the, the UI plugins. Now we've got some help from some of the other teams, the satellite teams, the Foreman team as to how they've implemented their plugins. So we're going to look at those, evaluate those. Um, Red Hat Access just happens to be one that uh, has been bugging us for probably since we got here to, to get that plugin in. And that, that's, while that's a downstream only project, um, it will help us design the prototype for the plugins you know, for upstream as well. So be we'll able to allow um, us to handle other plugins like Foreman. I mean, the Foreman group said, hey, why don't you, when you get to one of our Foreman objects, let them kind of branch off into our UI inside your UI. You know, why not? We have, we've got a couple things that we can plug in. Okay, great. You know. So as we get those, um, they, they can follow that same, uh, that same plug-in pattern. As far as refactorings and re rewrites, um, reporting UI is one thing. I mean, it just, it just has been a long time. We've just got, kept, kept layering different things on top of it. So the question becomes, uh, let's talk about breaking reporting out a little bit. So. If we do that, we have a chance at that point to kind of give it its own, its own face, a new face. Okay? If we don't, then we just uh, kind of keep it where it is and, and, and fix it up as, it, as, as best we can. Um, layouts we're going to talk about a lot. This is where we're still using that proprietary DHLMX stuff. And it, while it is a GPL license, it's, uh, you know, we want to get, it, get, get back to something better. Um, the problem with those is they're, they're a little uh, constricted and you know, they're, they're a little hard to work with. So. I can't do everything you want to do. Um, we want to try to start using the REST API for the UI. Um, it's going to be tough. The UI does some pretty complex things. I mean, anybody who's been running the product uh, can see that you know one click can cause a lot of things to happen in the back end and, and generate a lot of uh, data coming back um, that's gathered from a lot of associations and things like that. So it's hard to say whether the, the REST API can keep up with us, but we'll figure out a way to at least have an API to call. Um, we're currently in the process of re uh, replacing prototype with jQuery. Again, at the beginning of Rails, we bit off on the prototype thing and went nuts on it. And, you know, we've been trying to use jQuery as much as possible, but uh, uh, now we need to convert and get rid of prototype out of product. And then the, the cleanup stuff. I mean, generally, basically, we've been we've been already started doing this, moving things to service objects, presenters, helpers, getting things out of the controllers and the views, pushing them back. You know, we're going to push some stuff behind the REST API. Things like we're not taking up too much time here. Okay. Um, as far as JavaScript controls, I mentioned DHTLMX. Um, they are still embedded in a few places. Some of these are easy to change. I mean, menus and toolbars and stuff, there's a lot out there. Patternfly has like, most of these things, so we might most likely replace these with the Patternfly equivalents. Um, again, getting away from that license. Um, but the layouts are the top priority. You know, we're going to go into details of how our layouts are set up right now and why they're restrictive for us and, and how they're going to help us uh, get to the pluggable. Type UI edition thing. Um, there's a newer version of Dynatry out that we just we just actually converted to Dynatry um, called Fancy Tree. It brings us all some more some more features. So we're, we're, that's an easy one for us to do. Uh, as far as the charts, we we're currently using um, in the product we're using proprietary charts, flash charts. So we wanted to, didn't want to drop the charting support. It's a pretty valuable piece for the for the upstream project. So we, we put it in as uh, JQplot, which is an open source project, which has a lot of plugins. So we put it in, but it's, right now it's kind of read-only. You can't, they, in the product you can drill into things. Uh, and 
JQ plot, I went up to you can only just see them, and that's it. You just have to do it and see what you can do at that time. But there's tons of plugins and things where we can, we can mark hotspots and, and do kind of the same thing we're doing upstream. All right, oh, styling improvements. Those, yeah, those we're going to cover as well. All right. So now, I'm um, going to turn this over to Martin. He's going to talk about uh, internationalization, the project that we're, we've already started and we're working on. And uh, here you go. Okay, I will only, only quickly go through this boring topic. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not boring for the customers, but it's surely boring for the developers. <laughs> but it has to be done. No, no, the errors are right. I don't know. I see. So basically, we started looking at the solutions that are available for, for this type of work. We were looking at the text and Rails in, in 89. We decided to go the get text way because it's more compatible with, uh, with other workflows and products that uh, are already in Red Hat. There's a bunch of stuff that has to be done. Basically, well, we have to get the dependencies in, do a bunch of conversions where we already use some, some uh, E18 and stuff. And of course, we have to find all the translatable strings all over the application. So this means views, controls, models, JavaScript, basically everything. Uh, then uh, this will also introduce some uh, workflow changes for us, both for the programmers and uh, for, for the release engineering, because we have some stuff to check when we, when we do release on productization. So this is just some basic examples of what this will look like. This, this, uh, the, Issue that we were looking at is basically that uh, we will use the text itself as the key for lookup the, and the other translations. But it should be quite simple. Then there will be some rake tasks that will help us in the workflow or developers to get all the strings uh, that need to be translated. That's basically it. And then we have a list of uh, specialties that are specific for our product that need to be addressed uh, when doing the uh, internet search. It basically means that we have some special dictionary class that, that translates uh, model column names. So then we have to deal with the productization itself because we have some overrides that, that uh, help us to change text in the product in a very simple way from what's uh, in the in the project, then we will have to do some build automation uh, automation uh, changes and we will have to deal with the pre-generated content such as, such as reports and widgets in the end. This is probably the last thing that we will deal with. Uh, de deal with. Well, uh, the tool that's used by translators in, uh, in Red Hat uh, that we want to uh, also use is uh, Zarata, it help, help us to simply communicate with the translators. There's, uh, there's a nice library that allows uh, us to work with that, uh, with that application that's online somewhere else. There's a website running that tool. Uh, so we can use some command line tool to communicate with this, uh, like create new versions uh, for the translators, push, push our strings and pull translated strings from, uh, from the tool. So that's it. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, one uh, one uh, uh, thing I wanted to mention is, is that there are some, uh, some questions about how we will address the productization stuff. There's a bunch of tools that can do that. Uh, already included in the get text. Uh, there are chains that can be used for uh, both for for the productization stuff and also can be used for logging things that, uh, that uh, need translation that we, we are missing. So one more topic that I would like to touch is Red Hat Access Integration. Basically Red Hat Access means Red Hat Customer Portal. It provides uh, interface for customers uh, to their tickets. To, uh, they can also upload their logs for, uh, for Red Hat people to help them work with their issues. They can also work with the knowledge base, they can search it, and they can submit their issues. And this all can be done directly from several products that already have this type of integration implemented. So this is really, again, quite straightforward because there's already an integration library that has been created to work with the Red Hat Access. It's based on Angular UI. 
it's, it's based on Angular.js, so, so we will just, just use, that, use that as other projects already do. And there's even, there's even a thin wrapper around that uh, for Rails application that's used by format. So we will basically take that and make some uh, um, minor changes to use that, and it will be done. So we're going to host them in the same place? Sorry? We're going to host them in the same place? Oh, we will. Uh, well, you guys should talk to some of the people about Red Hat. Yeah, yeah, there are already some discussions uh, being, being, being led, and we will probably fork, fork this, name it, or maybe try to uh, generalize it somehow, make it uh, like more plugin for uh, Rails applications. Sure, yeah. well, now, it, now it's more, more uh, format specific. Hey, Mark, is that, uh, does that include like ABRT? ABRT. Oh, okay, uh, actually, I'm it? not sure. Okay. I, I, think I'm not sure. I think it can have different levels of integration. Yeah, you, you can that. upload blocks automatically from your application, or if there is some, some issue, you can upload blocks. Well, we will probably start just by adding the menu so that customers can access the knowledge base. Search okay. for search knowledge base it will probably be the first, uh, first step. Then once we have customers' credentials for the Red Hat customer portal, we can also access issues. We can both create issues directly from, uh, from the product and search status of existing issues, stuff like that. So the value for the community in doing this work is that what, we're going to get a plugin, a UI plugin framework? Or It'll be the first example of that, or yeah. what, what's the... Well, from the community point of view, yes, we will have a very, very simple, let's say, UI-only plugin. Okay. The, well, almost UI-only, there will be little down on the backend. This is basically Angular stuff, so it will be compatible with uh, our other works in the UI. So that, that's basically it. So the community can use this once it's done to create another UI plugin. Hopefully. That's what we're, yeah, there will need to be one step closer to that. Yeah. That's it. All right, so um, Eric's been doing some work on uh, the, our first Angular prototype to replace our, uh, one of our edit screens, because our edit screen is very interactive with the server. So um, you can explain kind of what he's been doing and how it might help out. All right. Um, these slides are kind of technical, so I have a lot of code on them. But basically, this is just kind of a basic overview. It's kind of hard to see. But like previously, as like a jQuery version, like you have some things that need to be you know, shown from the start or hidden from the start or whatever. And you know, there's some code over here to like, oh, if this is visible, you know, when I click on this toggle button, you know, it hides one and shows the other, and it, or you know, it shows one and hides the other, whatever. Um, Angular version uses um, it's direct in the markup here, so we have like a show and a hide, and there's a specific method that you can write, and that'll return you know like the form state. And when you click the button, you're you're changing this variable of form state, so um, it's just it's a little bit easier to test, and it keeps it isolated. And um, this control, this this uh, JavaScript here is is a controller in JavaScript, and so um, up here, this container has is uh, using that controller. So I mean, if you wanted, you could put that controller on other containers, and so it's just kind of nice and isolated, reusable. <coughs> Um, here's an example of something that needs to happen where there's one, two, three, four different things that could be shown based on, you know, we have a lot of things right now where the controller is setting a certain variable and then in the view we have a bunch of logic that says, you know, if this variable is, you know, VM, then show this part, otherwise show this part, and there's a lot of logic in the views right now. Um, that could be potentially pushed into uh, the JavaScript, and we have all of the data already there. And then, you know, right now, and this is simple, it's just saying, oh, type is two. Um, but, you know, there could be data that gets uh, changed in the JavaScript instead, and it's showing and hiding based on that data. Um, this is ng model, which, um, so you can see here we have the model names. This gets bound to stuff in the JavaScript. So when I change the name, the address, or these inputs, rather, um, 
this is going to get bound. And so now when I click the submit button, I can send up that data of what's being typed in there. And it's just like a regular form submit, but um, you know, we, can, we do a lot of AJAX transactions like this right now, um, where it is sending up the data. And so this way, it's just, it's, uh, it's encapsulated in these methods. So is the JavaScript embedded into the HTML? Is that? Oh no, this is a separate file, sorry. This no, is this function calls like Oh yeah, these are they're called directives. So it's like a um, it's just like a property, like a, the style property or um, you know, like stuff like that. So it's just directly on the HTML, yeah. Isn't that like the opposite of what we've been doing? I mean we used to do this in the past, like doing on clip equals whatever function calls, we got away from that. Kinda. Um, it's it's kinda like that. I mean we have, um, right now we have like a lot of, uh, and we do have, we do have a lot of like on clicks, but we also have a lot of um, JavaScript in the controller that's just doing like, you know, like page dot replace and then it's just feeding out JavaScript from the controller. Well, what I'm saying is, isn't this what we want to get away from? If we want to progressively update to say like, okay, here's the HTML, and then later on we bind JavaScript to that, rather than having this like this tightly coupled to JavaScript with our markup. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can do that if uh, I mean, there's I mean, we can talk about you know different ways to do it. I'm not married to this solution. Um, this is just what I've used as in, you know this is how Angular works. So um, I like this solution, but I'm not opposed at all to. Um, to you know, having you know, like you're saying, right? You're just saying like bind something to the class of submit button, right? In the JavaScript, yeah, I'm not opposed to that. Um, this is just how. Does it, Angular support that? I don't know Angular at all. Um, it's it's. I mean, you can. Yeah, you can. Um, I mean, you can create your own directives like this. I mean, like ng click. I mean. It's, Kind of the same thing, right? You're you're putting something on an HTML object or HTML, you know, a DOM element, um, and have it do different stuff. But um, as far as like, I mean, this is a pretty basic example. But um, like for something like this, you might not want to use, you know, this. But um, could you dynamically attach it, like UJS style, but you know, attach the NJ click NJ click and UJS type thing after the page loads? Um, yeah, you could. It's kind of, it's kind of weird because then it's like, you, you're not sure if it's like, um, I mean, it's hard to track exactly where that's being added at that time because, you know, like here it's like you can tell that, oh, like this is clicked and, or, you know, that there's something happens when, when this gets clicked. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like, you know, if you do that in the JavaScript, you still have like if you just have this with no with nothing here, it's like it just looks like it's some button that does nothing. But you have to look at the JavaScript and you can see it there. And so, uh, I would say this is like two generations away from what we are doing now. And the fr first step that we were considering is like moving the one generation because now we have the JavaScript being generated on the server side, and we do a bunch of round trips right. to get to get the JavaScript basically. We are doing stuff on server that's being done, normally being done on the client. And this the Angular is like one, one step further. It allows, allows you, instead of writing that JavaScript code that's run, run on, that runs on the client, it allows you to do that in a declarative way. So that you limit the number, li limit the number of lines of JavaScript that you write, and you use HTML tags, and use Angular to, let's say, figure out the JavaScript for you. So it's like, right. well, it's going to be a big, big transition to do something like that because... Uh, yeah, it is, it is definitely, and it is, um, I mean, it does lend itself a lot to kind of like single page apps kind of things. Uh, I mean, our app is huge, so obviously it's not going to be, you know, we probably don't want to use it like that, but um, it's very good for that kind of stuff. But I think the whole new, uh, unintrusive JavaScript movement was a reaction to people saying, I want to bind to this click, I want to bind to this click, I want to bind to this click. Right. Which I can see how that code looks similar to that. But the 
Does not work without JavaScript. It's not uh, obtrusive uh, at all. So it's right. So, so this is just, just a way of binding, binding the binding the elements to the to the data. Right. But it's the spaghetti code that Prototype and jQuery were introducing before the unubiquitous JavaScript was a reaction to say let's work without JavaScript. Versus here is trying to say what would happen if you declared your functionality in more of a functional manner, saying I have this kind of a component here. Exactly how the, the individual fields link together, we're not really that worried about that. We just have a field, this is uh, the ng model, we'll say, okay, this is like JavaScript wise, this is how we bind to this, this is how we bind to this, this is how we bind to this. But in a higher concept versus the unubiquitous JavaScript, you add the class to that individual node and you bind to that individual class. So you could either put a CSS class on it or an ID on it that you're going to take the data from, or in this case, you just have to do an ng model dash, whatever it is. So at least those aspects are exactly the same between the two. Um, and but now, uh, because they're uh, doing something still from backbone, where they're just concentrating on boxing this into one set of functionality and doing more like a small talk controller, then you, you box this and the form is all just bound to one component. It's a little bit of proprietary components. The next version of Angular is trying to go more on the web components that people are still designing. But at least it allows, um, there's not the spaghetti code aspect, which is the whole thing behind an unobtrusive JavaScript that was all in reaction to such a spaghetti code, jQuery, and or prototype driven code. Right. So, I mean, it's, 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 but it's uh, I mean, going more towards the functional higher level rather than, just, you do not find any clicks. You're not, buying, you're, not, you're not looking at events anymore. You're saying, okay, the state of this form is something. And based upon that state, you're just doing something a little bit there, but at least you're trying to right. object oriented. I mean, we can encapsulate you know, the jQuery stuff too if we want to. So. Um, here's another example. This is kind of like, this is, with, this is the ng switch, but it's using, um, it's, it's combining with ng models. So, um, you have something like you know a light and a dark option for colors or whatever, and when you pick one of those, that sets this ng model binding, and then that shows you you know oh well, here's your your light colors and here's your dark colors. So in the product here, it's like you know I click on the VM analysis and this is shown up here with with the VM selection and all VMs, and then you you go to template analysis and it changes this section. Um, so it's just like basically like a hide and show kind of thing, but it's just all done um, based on what uh, you're choosing from that dropdown. And we have a lot of this where before, when I you know clicked on this and changed, it sent a request up to the server and said, hey, what did I just change to? And then you know it was going through a, a, a big case statement for um, to see what it would show. Um, and it, it didn't even change what it would show, it would send the whole Part of the down, whole, yeah, yeah, rather than just flip a switch. So now we save the transaction and the data flowing. Right. Um, let's see, what is this? Oh, uh, this is the same kind of thing on change, um, except this is with a method call. So um, what you could do is, like, when you pick the drop down, um, it can generate. You know options for you. So, for example, this function. Well, when you pick light, it. I mean, right now it's just shoving color names into an array. But I mean, you could you could make that a, a call to the to the server if you wanted to. Yeah. So for more complex things, where we need a bigger list, but we like want to this. get that up front. You know, let's get it when we need. So it. for here, for VMs for cluster, when you pick the cluster, we come back and we've returned you know a JSON array of a bunch of clusters. You pick the VMs for hosts. And it returns a JSON uh, thing for hosts, so it's just a uh, smaller, um, easier to manage, like API endpoints, basically. Um, and then there's these bindings. This is just um, this is just direct HTML. Um, you know, when I set the message variable in my JavaScript somewhere. You know, let's say they put their name and they put their address in, and it doesn't matter what they put their favorite color in because we send it, and the message changes changes to your favorite color is blue, and 
the, change, the color changes to blue, and now when they after they submit the form, they see that their favorite color is magically changed to blue. Um, the message says that it's blue. Um, that's just a way to right here. You can see well, it's hard to see, but um, click on the action, and you know I, uh, this was before. It's like I changed from VM analysis to uh, template analysis, and this. The little thing that just says, you know, VM selection or template selection changes just based on that, and that's just, you know, a very basic um, binding because um, instead of having to send the whole thing down again, it just gets bound to uh, something in. in your... uh, a big piece that I think we'll probably use a lot is uh, services. So um, I think a lot of the code right now can be broken out. In the JavaScript into services, so that you know, well, when I submit this form, it needs to do something cool, and you know, whatever that does can be shared functionality. Um, you know, I don't know what this does, but it does something cool. Um, <laughs> this uh, dollar HTTP is built into Angular, and that's for making HTTP requests. So that's another service <coughs> that uh, comes with Angular, and uh, that's what you use for. Posting and getting and all that kind of stuff. So I think that I think that this is probably something that we could definitely um, use a lot, just because we have a lot of um, logic that can be pushed down into the JavaScript and that probably can be reused. Um, and again, you know, if it's not Angular, we can at least extract out a lot of some of the common functionality into some JavaScript stuff that uh, that can be. Uh, that's it for me. Well, back to kind of Aaron's question: Is Angular kind of the the destination that we kind of want to get to, or is it, or is it, if not, is it a stepping stone to the destination that we want to get to, or we're still trying to figure out the destination? Well, a lot of groups are using it. Foreman was using it when they came to talk to us, and uh, we've been looking at it for a while. Was using it? Panafly used it, and uh, so we have decided to come up with a prototype for it. We've got it; it's almost ready to be. It's in a PR almost ready to be merged. So. Uh, I'm going to test it out, see how it looks, and see how, uh, how well it works, and how much difference it makes, especially in, in edit form. I've got a lot of edit forms, and I think we can easily recreate uh, what Eric's done in all of them. I want to be able to kind of you know, the rest of them. Um, as far as you know, overall larger on the product, it may help, especially since we're using pattern flags to start doing the layouts and things. It may help us be more responsive and be able to uh, support plugins and stuff, especially if uh, the former groups used to be putting in an Angular plugin. You know, you know, I know this is going to be better than what we have. Yeah. Uh, I guess my, my main question is, I don't know enough about the yep. UI to kind of have a strong opinion. Yep. Um, but I don't know whether Aaron's kind of question is, you know, his, his concern is, is that something that's shared or is that something that's Aaron has so about kind of. Well, we'd have to see. we have to see what more the detail behind it. I mean, we're all always open to share that. But that, that, that's the question. Is the whole movement has been going towards an un unobtrusive? Yes, UI. exactly. Yeah, I mean, unobtrusive is the one where you don't bind. It's it's where you it's look like at the HTML binding. and it's HTML. Okay. It's it's more like late binding. So you define your markup and you do, you declare IDs for things. We say you know this is my X Y Z form, and the unobtrusive part comes along and it says here's the JavaScript, and when the page is ready to load, hook up all the events after the fact. If you okay. um, and it it keeps that separation of duties. And, to Aaron's point, this kind of undoes that because you have to, on each piece, declare this is an ng model or this is an ng this or that. So, um, no. so you're mixing metaphors. It kind of containerizes it, though. Yeah. It, yeah. It makes you know, so like a little step component and drop it in the place we want to get to. Well, it, that's really one of my questions. But that's a question with the UI in general is yeah. that could this UI work without JavaScript? No. And a lot of our UIs can't. Right. So then. But then the question is, do we go yeah, how do you this do file, or do yeah. we go the unobtrusive right, file? Right. And if so, which, which technology do we use to get with it? Is unobtrusive really about having websites that can work without JavaScript and with JavaScript? Or is it more about separation of concerns and keeping all my JavaScript here and all my markup here and you know, letting the designers work on the markup in CSS and letting the developers work on the JavaScript type stuff? But it's the same person. No, it's not, not necessarily. No, no, that's not necessarily. CSS is I I no, it's the whole I don't thing. know a thing about CSS. But the, to be honest, the, 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 the I defer to Eric every time. But I can totally write JavaScript. 
and you control the right HTML. So I'm saying yeah, the HTML and the JavaScript are kind of the same person. No, no? Always not. But no, um, doesn't have to be question, Aaron. It's like which way is it what is the point of UJS, I guess? <laughs> well, I just wonder, when I, when I saw that, I thought, well, what if I want to change the functionality of that one particular thing? Now I've got to touch the HAML, and I have to touch the JS? Mm -hmm. Well, like, what do you mean? Like, you want to change the functionality of that function? Or <coughs> No, I want to change what that tag does. Like, when you press the submit button on that, now I've got to go, do I need to change the function name, too? Do I have to touch well, no, I would just, I mean, you would change the JavaScript, right? Because that function is, is bound to that button. But if it's shared, then it's you well, you, you, I mean, you you have a controller for that form, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you're if you're reusing that controller, then yeah, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna change it in both places, basically, right? But um, I mean, that's you would normally just change the one function and you'd be done. I mean, if you want, if you have shared stuff, that's where you would use the service, and then you could. Then you would change it, and you would expect it to change in both places. Um, I would say that from uh, from my point of view, this solves problem that we don't have yet. Because if we if we're like more up to date, we would not do so many round trips and would not implement that much on servers. Mm -hmm. A server we would do it in JavaScript, and we would have that spaghetti type of JavaScript either in jQuery, whatever, or XJS, Dojo, Smart Client, whatever. We would have like controllers on the server done in done in Ruby, and we would have sort of controllers that would do all the binding logic, transferring data from one piece to another, do, doing doing uh, Ajax query stuff like that in in, in JavaScript on the client. Mm -hmm. We would have that if. We were, let's say, one, one step further than we are now, because we are doing that now on backend. And way to address that problem that we would have that step, first, that step further is, is Angular, because it's trying to do all, all those things that you do, normally you do in JavaScript by writing code that fetches this bit from there, stuff like that. They are trying to address it in a declarative way, and that's what's JavaScript. The question is, can we skip, uh, can we skip the step? I don't know. Mm. Well, well, we don't have that problem that, that Angular is, is designed to solve. We probably would have it if, if we started changing all the stuff that we do on backend, if we start moving in the front end, we probably would have that problem.